talk. I love to talk into the mic. I love to talk. I'm Mike Levin. I've got some tails, so let's begin. I guess I don't need my hair up in a ponytail anymore. Ah, freedom. Yeah, that was for moving. There ain't many things that make me sweat. Moving is one of them. So I'm just about recovered. Good old air conditioner. More audio background distraction. Oh well. Jeeps are not the quietest car in the world either. Alright. Just getting on I-95 North. Car slowing down. People unfamiliar with the route. Slow at predictable places. That's fine. Yeah, so... I got a whole bunch of stuff over there in a nice car trip. This is part of what I have a vehicle like this for. I have my own moving truck. It's certainly not as good as a big moving truck or even a flatbed. However, in a pinch, you can get stuff back and forth. One of my next questions will be whether I put my mattress, my big main queen mattress, into my Wrangler Unlimited here. It fits. It shipped to me through Amazon, rolled into a spool with all the air vacuumed out of it, and then you just tore off the shrink wrap and it inflated. It took about a day for it to fully inflate out, but it's a nice modern mattress. It's a good manufacturing technique. And when I brought it to the Poconos place, I said, hey, I don't want to put it on the top of my car and be one of those people. I know it can fit in the car. So that was one of my first real experiences with strap-down straps, strap-down ratchet straps. And I've got a bunch of those, and I'll, I might use them again on another trip like this. Maybe after the work day. It might be late tonight. Who knows? I'm not sure how I'll do it, but I've got the urgency now, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, out of there. And uh, everyone who looks at my place says, oh, you have so much here, but I think it's not. It's the diminishing returns final stuff. I could just sweep it all into a dumpster and be done with it. Maybe I will. And uh, yeah, at the Pride Parade yesterday, which we were at in New York City, me and my kid, we were standing next to a wonderful gentleman who uh, is a little bit older than me. He's in his 60s and he was talking about these things going back years and years and how they've been getting smaller every year and moved a bit and you know he's one of those you know longing for the old days or rem reminiscing type people and you know what you knew is always going to be better than uh the current experience. You're always going to look back with longing. That's, that's kind of a truism. And he was from uh, the Bronx and uh, we got to talking about, you know, where I'm living, the move I'm making, and the many places I've lived over the years, you know. I never finished the story from the last video. I'm uploading that video to YouTube while I'm shooting the next one. Another form of magic. I never never thought we'd be there on Apple equipment. That seemed to have been a forever Apple no-no, but now now we're there. They couldn't not do it, you know? Progress. Uh, no matter how much for controlled conditions Apple wants to not do multitasking type things, they are, they are forced into it. Nothing is assumed. Uh, new realities, new normals always set in. And it comes with shifting expectations, generational shifting expectations. Things that are a miracle to one generation are uh, every day passe to the next generation, assumed. And this constantly impresses me. It takes me aback. It's, you know, dependencies. Now, we had these growing up. We didn't really know how televisions worked. They were a sort of magic on their own. But you could research it and understand how fluctuating electromagnetic signals made the sweeping passes of a electron gun against the back of a cathode ray tube, which is basically a giant light bulb coated with phosphorus that emits a glow when struck by this electron beam. 
and it was understandable. Um, one could, you know, hold all the premise in one's head and go, oh, that's how a TV works. It's like an oscilloscope where it's just a electron gun, like sparks being let out from a Van de Graaff generator, right? One can imagine energy being shot through the air. It's not totally alien to our experience. So, inside a vacuum tube, all the more so, no resistance for the electron. So, we know that even from light bulbs. You shoot enough electricity through a filament, you get heat energy, and it emits light as a byproduct. So, it's not a really long leap to imagine a little ray gun of electrons that can shoot inside a light bulb type device against a material that can glow when hit with electrons, right? We see that in other examples. Um, the inner coating of fluorescent uh, light bulbs, it's another case, but you know, of uh, electrons being shot through a gas or something, but we, we know that there's things that give off a glow and uh, hit with electricity. So the magic of my generation was how to show the picture once it reached you and how that picture came in over the airwaves. So there was a whole education about how television broadcast works, the difference between UHF and VHF, the difference between FM and AM, and it got into a wonderful discussion about electromagnetism and different attributes and properties of electromagnetic waves, their energy levels, their uh, wavelengths, uh, their frequency. And again, it drew pictures in your head that you could hold. So the magic of my generation was significantly less magical than the magic of this generation. If you are cut off from your TV, could pretty much do without it. You know, we were, <laughs> with the exception of some particularly television addicted people, we did not need television. It didn't enter the realm of food, clothing, and shelter. The bottom rung of the Maslow self, uh, of the, the Maslow pyramid of needs, hierarchy of needs. Cell phones kind of have mobile phones a broadband connection. Take someone from the current generation, cut them off from their mobile or broadband for a day, even an hour, and you've got a dysfunctional person. They don't know what to do with themselves. They can't quiet their mind. They need the constant stimulation of like an adult stroking their hair as an infant. It's, it's, it's sad. Now, this is typical. Every generation feels bad for the generation that follows them going, you know, they don't know the way things were, but that's the way things were. So are we always going to have that teat to feed from? Are we always going to have that 5G connection now from here forever on forward? Is it okay to be teethered to our smartphones? Is that just the new normal? Maybe, maybe. I, I keep an open mind. I try to keep an open mind. But I think that the ultimate app is the app of the mind. Nothing exists except for as it exists in your mind. I'm not a solipsist. I don't believe that only what exists in our mind is what exists. I, don't, I think that's BS. We live in a collective, objective universe. No one knows what that objective thing is. We each have our subjective viewpoints, and no matter what anyone says, their viewpoint is subjective too. Their viewpoint is no more objective than yours, except maybe scientists and engineers. Their viewpoint might be slightly more objective because they are skilled in the arts of observation and deep understanding of systems. That makes them better qualified to say what's objective than people living through life, piecing together loose associations of cause and effect. Engineers gotta get it right or people die. They're held to a higher standard. A 
bridge not collapsing is a fairly objective thing. When lots of people's safety are at stake, people tend to believe in objectivity more. That's why having college degrees in certain fields is actually important. That's why no matter how self-taught someone like me is in the field of programming, no one's ever gonna hire me as a primarily a programmer because that degree comes with certain assurances of experiences and knowledge of best practices. Sometimes you can demonstrate it from real world knowledge and experience and sometimes you don't need to demonstrate it to other people because you're doing things that work for yourself. You're doing things for yourself. Oh, does that bring us back to the LXD containers? And home, the discussion of home. Me talking to that guy yesterday at the Pride Parade. He was asking me where home is. I was like, yeah, well, for the past uh, 15 years, minus the two that I was in the Poconos, home has been Manhattan and Staten Island. Staten Island for two years, Manhattan for 13 years. In Manhattan, it was 16th Street neighborhood, Union Square, that was Union Square Park neighborhood. And then it was Columbia University neighborhood. And then it was Inwood, Spite and Dival neighborhood, which is at the very tippy top. And then it was Staten Island. It's like a thermometer, whoosh, up Manhattan, pop. Oh, you fall to the bottom, Staten Island. Staten Island, Staten is as Staten does. Boy, do I have some video to upload of the Staten Island vibe. Man, is it different. Is it a different vibe? It is different from the other boroughs. Oh my God. It's a good thing I'm a Philadelphian or I wouldn't be able to cut it. Staten Islands, I don't think are particularly ready for Philadelphians. They don't understand necessarily what a, what a Philadelphian is. They have pride in their toughness Staten Islanders as being the native New Yorkers who live in the shadow of Manhattanites who they both look down on and secretly, you know, covet, right? It's both things at once. And it gives this real tough guy attitude. You see it in the movies. You know, it's the native New Yorker attitude, but the ones who don't actually live in Brooklyn or the Bronx or Queens. They live on Staten Island. It might as well be New Jersey culturally. And facilities-wise, right? There's not even a subway. There's not even a train system that goes in and out of uh, Staten Island. It's the one disconnected borough. You gotta use uh, buses or, or the ferry. So the power of a car is a good thing to have. Being stuck on that island without a car limits you from opportunities, from everyday things that come up that you could just take advantage of and have a better life because public transportation doesn't bring you there. So then Ubers, Ubers and Lyfts and Lyfts and Ubers, then you're dependent on that. And the question is, why not just learn to drive? Do like everyone else does on Staten Island and New Jersey for that matter. Without the power of the car, you know, you are once again less than a fully <laughs> realized human being. It's an extension of our bodies, just like reading and literacy. And, you know, being able to drive spontaneously is the equivalent of reading for pleasure. Reading for pleasure makes you smarter. Being able to drive just whenever makes you capable. I'm sorry. <laughs> Without it, you're kind of like a bird without wings, a bird who's supposed to have wings that doesn't have their wings. A winged monkey without the wings. They are winged monkeys, by the way, in the wonderful Wizard of Oz, and not flying monkeys from the Wizard of Oz. People who draw all their information from TV shows are only just getting what is the clues and the hints left 
so that you can develop yourself more deeply and fully, emotionally, spiritually, as a human being. So, the actual payloads, the actual messages of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass are so powerful and compelling that Disney chose it as to be one of its uh, hallmark animated movies from the early days, and they did it well, and they got a lot of things right. Disney, or Alice purists, are sometimes upset, but you know what? Disney contributed to the popularity. They left the clue in mainstream culture that there's something valuable to be experienced there if one just can get past the thought that they've already experienced it from watching the movie. The same goes for The Wizard of Oz. Bam, 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 pow, pow, pow. Again, from my generation, it's instilled into us from the annual airing, the annual broadcast, which was its own sort of Christmas tree. Oh, The Wizard of Oz is on today. The Wizard of Oz is on tonight. Let's watch it as a family and bond. It will be a common experience. It's fun for the whole family. It's got many lessons and is a valuable experience in and of itself. Walk in Dorothy's shoes for an hour and a half. However, it is honestly still, even with its wonderful movie adaptation, just a glimmer of the growth potential being provided by L. Frank Baum's channeling of truth, of deep life experience in ways that you will not encounter in everyday life. Now, there are those who will write off this kind of media as kid stuff, as having nothing of value to offer, that it's made for kids. Same with high quality cartoons that have valuable messages. They will snub it and poo poo it going, that's just made for kids. Adults consume adult media. Well, that is a surefire path to emotional stunting, stunted growth. If you don't go through the rite of passage, the mind expanding, the walking a mile or even a life in other people's shoes deeply in the suspended disbelief, transformed consciousness state that only reading can provide, then you have not received the gift from L. Frank Baum, Lewis Carroll, C.S. Lewis. There's a ton of them. J.R. Tolkien. If 
I only had a heart. Wow, the book interpretation of the Tin Woodsman is one of the real splits. The Tin Woodman is a mystery. Nick Chopper, they don't even use his name in the movie, but the Tin Woodman has such a interesting history and is so much different from what the movie would lead you to believe that he is. And he's a wonderful example of the turtle vibe, right? Soft on the inside, uh, switching from predatorial to herbivore. He wouldn't hurt a fly, so he, you know, wears shell armor. Not on purpose, this was done to him, but nonetheless, it makes the, the old softy, the blue character, armored strong and badass, axe-wielding badass, right? So in the books, you don't mess with the Tin Woodman. You don't send your crow and wolf minions out to attack Dorothy and her companions, because one of her companions can dispense with those crows and those wolves quite handily. Don't mess with a tin woodsman. Tin woodman? Whatever. And uh, his capacity for primal violence is not conveyed in the movie, shall we say. It does not come across. But his capacity is only for a type of knee-jerk reaction, practiced muscle memory violence. He can solve problems quickly with his axe and his dexterity. That's one way to do it. It's the martial arts way. Spontaneous mastery. It's the same way as musical instruments. You have a tool, you know how to use it well, you always have that tool on you. In a pinch, you can make other things stand in for that tool. You can make do without the tool, in fact, when it comes down to your bare hands. These are all parts of martial arts. You can marshal your resources to great effect. It's a great skill to have when you are an old softie because old softies can't stop and think. Their passion overtakes them. That's the Tin Woodman character. That's the character inside Dorothy's head. Even though Dorothy honestly went to Oz in the books, this is not, you know, a dream like Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Dorothy really went to Oz. Dorothy brought Aunt Em and Uncle Henry to Oz. She brought physical things back and forth to Oz. The books are different than the movie, for sure very American, very giving the readership what they wanted. You ever know those books that yank the audience around, always giving them what they don't want because it's what the author wants to do? Not the Wizard of Oz series, not the first 14 books. L. Frank Baum gave his readers, his beloved readers, whose letters he read, every one of them as stories go. He gave them what they wanted. He used the best parts of the story, of the best parts of the ideas sent to him. He would collect them and go, you know, this works, oh, that's a good idea, and work it out as sort of a three-dimensional puzzle until he had his next book, and it told some important thing that it covered topics that the previous books didn't cover. The guy was brilliant. The guy was anticipating the virtual augmented world that we're just going into today. Oz is real. It's in the middle of the great desert in the United States somewhere, probably for the solar power for the Colo Center or geothermal energy. Tin Woodman was a martial artist and badass with his hands and his axe weapon because that's all he could do when triggered. The scary
scarecrow is untriggerable, except maybe by fire. So when you have a great intellect, a humble great intellect, they know their weaknesses, and uh, their enemies often know their weaknesses too. It's to trigger them in a way that they cannot cope with. In the case of the scarecrow, it was clearly fire. In the case of me and in my life, it's something analogous. And, uh, you know, I'm talking about these books. I'm not talking about myself. The scarecrow can stay calm, cool, and collected, unlike the uh, emotional Tin Woodman. And when the scarecrow stays calm, cool, and collected, he can defer the instant gratification of doing something all martial artsy in favor of a plan, of thinking things through, of looking around and observing, seeing, taking the lay of the land, making strategic assessments. The scarecrow is Sun Tzu. So you take the lay of the land and you make strategic assessments and then you look at the way and the weather and the leadership and the terrain and the discipline of your own self and, and friends and the resources you can marshal. And you look at the way, the weather, the terrain, the leadership and the discipline of the opponent and their resources that they can marshal and the optional locations of engagement. Does it have to be on their territory? Can it be on your territory? How does it all play out? And then the Scarecrow can add to this imagination, imagination, stuff beyond the strategic assessments, that kind of stuff that makes us uniquely human. Piecing together ideas, we're all imitation machines. There is no completely new idea because we are products of everything we experienced, right? We're products of everything we experienced. So what is ever truly new and original? The answer is not much, but we synthesize it all together under our own unique hand on the helm, hands on the steering wheel, in order to make it appear as such. We let trucks that are clearly in a hurry go past us to get behind white pickups that are erratic in their driving. And they're a nice pair together. And then they're both in the right hand lane and I pass them both because I'm the one who's staying, well staying on, no, I'm the one who's, what is it now? Begin yeah, end 280. I'm the one getting on 80. They're going on to 287. It's so hard to, to keep in mind. So 280 becomes 287 if you go off to the right here, coming close to the Delaware Water Gap. But 280, which is the road from out of New York, becomes... No, 80, which is the road from out of New York, becomes 280 here, uh, going towards the Delaware uh, Water Gap. Wow, what a... What a treat and a pleasure it was, these two years in the Delaware Water Gap. You know, one of the things in life that you have to be careful about, 11th hour poisoning of recollection of experiences. No matter how wonderful an experience is, an emotionally immature person will latch on to that one thing in the 11th hour before departure. The final mile, in the final mile of the race, you did the race all so, so great, the marathon, and you're in the last mile of the marathon, and something now pops into your head. You know you're gonna have to deal with this thing once the marathon is over. You know you're gonna have to deal with this thing once the 11th hour, once it hits midnight, or once it hits noon, or whatever, and you're on the road. So, in storytelling, it's often called the third act complication. Second act complication that gets resolved by the third act. So the second act complication 
is in situations where the people haven't been around the block a few times, in situations where there just hasn't been enough growth as an individual, will latch in very firmly, inextricably, like an animal clawing and biting for survival into something that wasn't an issue up until that point. And that will be all that exists in their mind and they will not be able to let go. I did that moving out of Irby. Irby, that deluxe little apartment complex in Staten Island that I lived in in two years. I had to take a third year lease because I didn't know what to do. I thought I was gonna be there for a third year, but it was three of us then. It was me, my new wife, and my kid on the weekends, all in a studio, plus three cats. They were all alive at the time. They progressively started to die, but they were old, they were 15 plus. I felt bad that they spent their final years in a studio. I let them out into the hallways. I have some wonderful pictures of that. As much as I could, they had these wonderful big windows, but the world shrank on these two wonderful cats, Billy and Sammy. Their world was never really that big. But I did get them out to the cat skills now and again. They were the two of the cats of the cat skills, two cats in the cat skills. I thought I was never gonna do that. I thought it was unrealistic. And then I had to sell the place in Inwood, that upstate Manhattan uh, apartment. I had one of these half million dollar Manhattan apartments. So problems are blah, 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 blah. Problems are like money. It's meaningless. Again, read the opening chapter to Hitchhiker's Guide. There is no contest. There is no legacy. You probably have an immortal soul, but everything that this immortal soul has to look up and experience is what you're cramming in your time on the material plane. Normally, it's something a lot more boring and uh, uneventful, you know, pure vibes, lots of questions, what if this, what if that, unanswered questions. Outside the material world, almost certainly feels like longing for answers. If only this, if only that, that's where if only, yeah, but, I just, that's where in the material world, when you're not on track and you get caught in a kind of feedback loop where you can't let go, it all is about the past. It's the only things you can look to for answers. I just, yeah, but. And again, it's one of those signs of, you know, having a lot of growth still in front of you. Because if you get caught in a feedback loop of the experiences you just had or have had so far and you can't move beyond them and answering new questions or even the same old questions in new ways, then your time here on the material world is not serving its intended function to explore, to try, to probe, to ask the what ifs and the yeah buts and the I justs become I will and I did. Yeah, but becomes this time I. And I just becomes here's why. Knowing your reason for things is kind of important. It comes in time, it comes in time. Your reason for, th the reason for things for a lot of people is to have more money in their bank accounts, right? It's the contest, it's the British way. The British Isles and the protection rackets and the class system. It's fine, you want that, you have that. You're welcome to it. And the hows is to get into the rat race, to be a hamster on the hamster wheel. That's your hows and your whys. Your why, because Everyone's in a rat race and has a place on the hierarchy. Your house 
by climbing rungs of the ladder, by following the prescribed routes of people who come before you with very little imagination and using, you know, those techniques that are known to work. There are those. Those people die yelling Rosebud. You can have an empire, but the thing that's really important to you is the thing you forgot.
being an old softy, you know what's best? You take this you take the scarecrow with their intellect and their sun tzu and their calm, cool demeanor and their ability to plan and apply imagination and observe things accurately. And you combine that with the badassness of the Tin Woodman and his martial arts and his shells and his weapons. The synthesis of the Tin Woodman and the Scarecrow is a badass being and one to admire and try to be like. The fusion, the best fusion is of the Tin Woodman and the uh, Scarecrow. Now, you're all probably asking, what about the lion? The lion has a New York accent, right? The one creature who is an outright tipping their hat to New York influence in all this. The Emerald City is New York. Do you not know that? You should know that. The Emerald City is New York City, particularly in the MGM interpretation. It's the urban center. It's where Aunt Em and Uncle Henry start out when they come to Oz and can't take it, being treated like royalty. So they go out into the suburbs of Munchkinland and get a little plot of land and are happy. You can pursue your vibe, even when you find your way to the Emerald City, even when you <laughs> throw out the humbug wizard and you put your uh, <laughs> transsexual rightful leader back into their uh, position as the wisest, most wonderful, and almost most powerful person in Oz. Not really the most powerful. Glinda is the most powerful. Glinda, who apprentices, who mentors the wizard, the outcast, the cast out wizard, the wizard who cast out Ozma, turned Ozma into a boy and made him as Tip a prisoner of old Mombi who, by no help of his own, you know, found, by no help of his own, Tip became Ozma again, regains control of Oz, but meanwhile, the wizard returned to Oz. What would you do if you were Ozma? You turned me into a boy, you made me a prisoner of an old witch, she was gonna turn me into a statue in her garden, and now you're coming back to Oz? Oh yeah, you can be an apprentice to Linda, who's even more powerful than me, I won't even be threatened by that. Add more true magic tricks to your bag of tricks, wizard, and join our crew on our adventures. Me as Ozma again, and you as the wizard, no longer a humbug, and Dorothy as her wonderful self and spiritual leader of the group, because even though she doesn't have the magic or the uh, hereditary royalty of Ozma, and even though she doesn't have the real magic and life experience of the wizard, and uh, even though she doesn't have all the intelligence and, you know, martial arts, and, uh, yeah, she's the lion. Dorothy is the lion. Yeah. I started out talking about the lion. The lion is Dorothy's true self. Dorothy's the lion. No denying, she's the lion. She stakes out on her own, running away from home because her local witch was gonna get her dog put to sleep. The local witch threatened the life of her pet. That caused Dorothy to run away. Dorothy ran away from home because the local witch threatened the life of her pet. And Uncle Henry and Aunt Em, who were basically on Dorothy's side, could not stand up to the witch because the witch had the deed to their property. Do you see? The witch held power over Henry and Em. And because the witch held power over Henry and Em, they could not stand up to her and that caused their kid to run away with their threatened pet. And then of course, you know, Dorothy finds her way 
to a vagabond carny who's roasting hot dogs and Toto jumps out of the uh, basket and eats a hot dog. And uh, the wizard says one of the great lines about one old dog to another. And later in the movie, he says, I'm a Kansas man myself. In the book, he's actually from Omaha, you know, the nearby Omaha. But I like to believe that it's Dorothy's father. And that when Dorothy runs away from home, seeking guidance from, you know, seeking life experience, seeking, you know, her, her coming of age story, to write her own story, Dorothy runs into none other than her true father, a man who made mistakes, a man who is on his own story arc of redemption. And you know what? The lizard is going to attack that as weakness. Watch. You watch. The lizard sits back and watches, conserving their energy through their crystal ball that only works once per day because it's broken. It's supposed to see anywhere, anytime, all the time. Like Linda's book, her magic book that you don't know about either because you've only watched the movie. Linda's really the most powerful witch in Oz because she's got the magic book that writes everything of importance that's happening everywhere in Oz. Her magic is better than everyone else's because she develops exactly the magic she needs in order to d deal with the problems she knows are brewing. This makes Glinda, the Good Witch of the North, the most powerful and her magic uh, the best. And this is who is teaching the wizard. This is who is mentoring the wizard, turning him into a mentat. She's the mentor, he's the mentant. Now the wizard will probably never be as powerful as, as Glinda. But he does not need to be. His story is, is mostly told. He has crossed paths in the life of Dorothy one, two, three times. That's his story. And that's enough. He doesn't need to have the little piece of paper contests. Oh, like my uncle's boy, let me tell you. The piece of paper contests and the comparing scorecards, man, the way they compare scorecards to each other and the way their relatives, the people around them go, oh yeah, uh, Bob has, has done okay for himself, but Mort, Mort's the one who's really living like royalty in Palm Spring, Spring Florida with Britney Spears as a neighbor. Right, so free Britney, right? Free Britney, it's a real good cause. I saw that in the parade yesterday. People love to take away other people's humanity. Especially those lizard types who are jealous of the deeper humanity that's developing in their, in their offspring. If a lizard type gives birth to a mammal type, the lizard type is gonna do everything in their power to keep their child from becoming a compassionate, empathetic, good human being. They're gonna see that as weakness. They only think reptiles are tough. They only think those who are skilled in the arts of ambush predation are the accomplished humans. They don't value emotion. They don't value sincerity. They don't value love. What we call love is, in great part, it is mostly, it is articulated in its higher order form in the care for helpless born young. 
and then it is retranslated in many times, many ways, to many situations. But the kernel of love comes from concern for one's offspring. There are different kinds of love. There's motherly love, right? Maternal love that's valued above all others, let's face it, and which can be used as a weapon. One must be able to identify that. One must have deep enough insight and observe a situation for long enough with a fine enough measurement instrument to understand when that's going on. To do that accurately, to do that well, one must have experience in these things. You can't just say it. You have to provide a game plan on where to look and why. Histories. And then you must put it in the hands of those who have dealt with such things repeatedly, far beyond what's going on in any single situation. So that this single situation starts to become more transparent, more obvious, more exposed. Meanwhile, I uproot my life yet again to move to this place that is not my vibe at all. <laughs> Poor little turtle moves amongst the, the alligators, right? I'm an alligator swimming in a pond of, uh, I'm a, yeah, alligator. Yeah, so there's a Freudian slip. I've learned to become the alligator. I have internalized the ways of the alligator. If someone's death rolling you, you know what you do when an alligator slaps itself on you and death rolls you? You be an alligator death rolling it straight back with the same amount of equal opposite force. You're yelling, you're yelling. I walk away from you. I won't hold this conversation. Yeah, that's what it feels like. That's what it sounds like when you're death rolled by an alligator and they realize it's not gonna work. They disengage and they swim off. They can't stay engaged. All they know how to do is death rolls. That's a shame. It's sad. So when you're the scarecrow and you know you're in a in an alligator manifested lake, or you have one particular alligator, Peter Pan does some deep channel, deep, deep channel. When you got one alligator who's going to constantly try and eat you because it got a taste of you. What do you do? Well, first, you never let it. You never let it get that chance to death roll you. And when it does, you have kind of a steel frame on your arm and a camera. So the alligator snaps onto you, starts to try and death roll you, you have the steel frame, so you have to resist. You use your martial arts skills, you use your Tin Woodman strength to take its death roll leverage away. If it can't fling its tail around and do that little propeller thing, it's not gonna death roll you. And then you ch -ch -ch with the pictures or video if you can, and you go, hey, look, an alligator trying to death roll me. I told you that happens, that's what you do. It's okay. It's okay to even talk about it like this. These are my stories and these are mine to tell. I'm just talking about The Wizard of Oz, right? I'm gonna start reading The Wizard of Oz stories online because they're all public domain, at least 40 of them. I won't, I, should I start with the, the main book? I should probably start with the main book. The times being what they are, it might be good to start with the second book and put it in context and then go back to the original book, A New Hope. A dramatic reading of A New Hope. Ha 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 ha. 
then I should really do some of the Star Wars books because as much as I put down Star Wars as being a knockoff of Dune, the actual books I'm led to believe have done some excellent channeling. They're some of the more recommended books because of how deep they get into this stuff. This stuff being fundamental vibes of living things. Things follow reptilian ambush predator vibes. Things follow empathic mammal vibes. What other major sweeping vibes are there? Let's talk about that lion. The lion is always an interesting one because the lion is a reversion to a reptilian vibe in a mammal creature. And then the cheetah is a reversion back from that, you know, reptilian vibed mammal back towards more mammal-like, albeit it only gets to pack hunting dog animal-like in my not back, not back to vegetarian. If you ever see cheetahs evolve into vegetarians, you will have seen the full circle. The full circle actually happens in the reptilian family branch more completely because of how alligator turtles have reverted back to ambush predators. Making the alligator turtle and the cheetah interestingly paired animals having gone through an extra cycle of epigenealogy epigenealogical adaptation epigenealogical adaptations epigenealogical adaptations do I have the name of this video do you know what I'm talking about there once was a day when a not-quite-cat-like mammal said, I'm done foraging for fruits and vegetables and, and leaves. You know what? I'm going to eat that other thing over there that's competing with me for those vegetable resources. And the cat was born. The branch of animals we call felines was born. Mammals in general by this time have become omnivorous. They could eat plants or animals, and when they ate animals, it was more like termites or opportunistic carrion, roadkill, such as it were. They won't, they won't say no to a shot of protein, but they're not hunters. They don't kill. Then one day they started killing and you had cats. Cats kill, killing cats. Cats kill, kill cats. Oh, da, 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 da. And then one day it's like, well, you can't really wait for them to come to you all the time. There's less grass. You, uh, you can't lunge out at them and ambush predate all the time. The watering halls are more rare and few and far between. Sometimes you gotta run them down. You gotta run down that prey. Well, how do you run down the prey? You give up a little bit of what it takes to be an ambush predator. The strong lunging ability, the fangs that dig in for the immediate kill, and you go with a stronger jaw for holding an animal. So when you're running after it, you can grab it and hold it in sort of a tackle, and you go for more of a dog-like gait, a greyhound racing dog, a fast dog-like gait. And so one day these ambush predation cats said, oh, I want that food over there. The lions can't get it because it's way over there. I can get it if I can run and get it. And cheetahs were born. They were cheetahs. They cheated. So now you know what I'm talking about with epigenealogical uh, transformation, epi epigenealogical decisions, that decision to go after a different resource and to cause different physical attributes in your body to be valuable, you now have willed a body change into being through your behavior, through your visualizations, through, a, through projecting a template in your mind. 
and then the random mutations don't simply bring you from this ambush predator to that more greyhound dog-like design. It's not just random mutations. Do you think so many random mutations are gonna line up to be just right to transform you from lunging big cat to svelte sprinting cat? No! It's epigenealogy. Google the other Mike Levin. Michael Levin. Biochemist. Michael Levin. TED Talk. Michael Levin. Epigenealogy. Genetic traits. Manifestations of previously non-expressed genetic traits can be willed into existence. Sentience can do that. This is why you think yourself young. A duh. And I don't want to diss on overweight people. But you can think yourself more physically fit too. It is partially behavior, but it is, it is partially projecting the image of yourself in and through you. My dad was much fatter than I am at 50. My dad started filling out in all the wrong ways that Homer Simpson beer belly. So I got it in me, right? It's not purely genetics. People who are like, oh, you just got the jackpot of genetics. No, it is both my epigenealogical expression and those of my ancestors. I give credit where it's due. I believe that on both sides of my family, they have a history of this, thinking themselves into what they want and need to be. Jews didn't make it to the United States if they didn't. Jews didn't make it if they didn't. Why are Jews so accomplished? They have no choice. Every society that, you know, serves as their home for some period of time wants to exterminate them sooner or later. Projection and jealousy, right? They always see in the Jews the worst attributes they fear in themselves. So kill the Jews, they all yell. It's their fault. It must be their fault because they're doing well in these economic and social conditions where in which everyone else is suffering. What makes them so good? Well, surviving, the ones who survived, the, the genocide attempts. Duh!
People who attack the things you love, that's a death roll. That's a reptilian death roll. Striking out right at the things you love or your greatest vulnerability. Growing up roughhousing with my kid because I made sure they got their share of roughhousing. Every single time they would go for my glasses, I would be like, look, kid, this roughhousing is something special in your life. I will think ahead and take off my glasses every time, but it's wrong. I should not have to. You doing that means you're getting the wrong lessons in life from somewhere. The rough housing is not about an immediate death row win. The rough housing is about like building up immunity to things you're allergic to. The, the rough housing is about becoming anti-fragile. I wish I had that language back then. Things are healthy by rough housing. Rough housing leads to anti-fragile and it's not leading to stability and stalwart stalwarts you know pillar of you know uh unmovability stability that's wrong that's a wrong image that guy whose name i'll eventually get who advocates anti-fragile in systems like stock markets that should be able to endure the ups and the downs is not saying things should settle into a static state. Static states are bad for the soul. Being in the money game and building legacy and little castles in which you can raise sheltered children who are out of touch with reality means you lost the game. That's one of the columns of losing. Lost. Trump gets lost. A duh. Those who can be picked up and dropped into any situation and still survive and do well, given whatever resources are around them and that they have access to, that's a new wind column. Being able to drive when you need to drive, I should still learn stick shift. At 50 years old, I'm getting the awakening that the ability to drive stick is still a thing. I, I should have it. I'm old school enough that I should know how to drive stick. I'll be getting a next car. This car is promised to my kid. My kid, if they make it to 16, is getting big red. I've made these promises. I've got lifetime warranty on this so long as I remain the owner. So my kid getting this car means they have full access to use the car as they wish and as they please. So long as they pay the gas, maybe pay the insurance, I'll probably take care of the insurance. Paying for the gas is a good first responsibility. They need to be able to earn gas money. But it's still got the lifetime warranty about parts wearing out. This thing is going to be driven to its demise. Tran new transmission? Free. New engine? Free. I paid $3,500 on top of the... Uh, price of the car to have Jeep insurance, which is something that off-roaders often do, because off-roaders treat their cars so intensely, you would ask yourself, how do they have the money for all these Jeep repairs? Well, they have this Mopair insurance or whatever, and uh, it's great. <laughs> it's great. And so my kids shall have the power of that as well. They'll be the secondary driver on my insurance plan. Wow, it's coming down. Coming down like cats and dogs. And I'm an hour and 10 minutes into the video. Wow, this was an emotional one. I love it. I love it. I'd rather be emotional in a car than being someone who attacks the driver of a car. Because I can keep control even when I get emotional driving a car. It's an easy skill. My car driving co-processor is finely honed. 
and I can trust it more than someone who can't con keep control of their own emotions and attacks the driver of a car. That's a situation that has happened to me in life more than once. Like they come after you and you're driving on the highway and they're hitting you and you're like, do they even understand what they're doing? Are these human beings? Do they not have a self-preservation instinct? Oh my God. It happened to me twice in life. These are my stories and they're mine to tell. Things don't get better until you shine the light on them. When you shine the light on them, there are sure to be death rolls. You meet those death rolls with the intelligence and foreplanning of the scarecrow. You walk bravely into those situations with the courage of the lion. And you are ready to improvise in the unexpected, facing the unexpected, with the martial arts skills of the Tin Woodman. And that, my friends, is why The Wizard of Oz is much better than Inside Out. That had to be so literal, that missed the real key points who didn't distill it down to still even fewer characters. And Wizard of Oz got it to three. They say there, were, there wasn't enough in Disney's Inside Out with, uh, what was it? Anger, joy, fear, disgust, and sadness. It's five. So Inside Out had five. Wizard of Oz got it down to three. sorry. I meant for you to mesh. I could have done more to help you mesh. And I received stories from, from neighbors who told me things way, way too late. I think you tried to tell me them, but like you say, they, they come out wrong. What can I do? What can I do if I'm not communicated to? I, I really honestly want to do the best job I can do. I want to make things possible where they didn't seem to be possible. I can do these things. I can work that magic. But I understand now that, that maybe I made mistakes. I understand now that I made mistakes. It's not maybe. I understand the mistakes I made. The wizard is not perfect. The wizard makes mistakes. The wizard must be on their own story arc of redemption. The wizard must be forgiven by Dorothy. The wizard must be forgiven by Ozma. Would you forgive? the wizard for condemning your childhood to that of slavery under a witch of old Mombi? As the opposite gender you were born from? On the way to become a statue to hold a water basin so squirrels could bathe in and you could watch from your window and entertain yourself? That's what Mombi had planned for Ozma in her tip form. Tip freed himself. Ozma freed herself. Through no help of the wizard. Their paths recombined years later. Common theme, friends of Dorothy. Dorothy forgave the wizard. Dorothy was not wronged by the wizard quite so deeply as Ozma was. Ozma had more forgiving to do. Would you forgive the wizard? 
when you give the wizard a chance is the proof in the pudding, is the proof in what the wizard does. Of course the proof is in the wizard does, what the wizard does. The proof is in how the wizard conducts himself. The wizard knows that conducting himself well is going to be a breeze because it's in his true nature. He did not mean to set Ozma on such a shameful path. An abysmal path. A dark path. Mombi wasn't even supposed to be using magic, right? Mombi was able to use magic because the Ozma family, the family of Oz, was outcast. Only the rulers of Oz could use magic. And so when Ozma came back, only Ozma could use magic. Ozma and Glinda, you know, Ozma couldn't stop Glinda, but Ozma being both sorceress and the political leader of Oz makes these laws. You know, everyone, you know, uh, allows the good witch to do her thing. Uh, but the bad witches are illegal. The bad witches, what makes them witches, are they're practicing magic illegally. There's the witch of the east, the witch of the west, and then there was a much lesser witch, right? She wasn't even good enough to be considered one of the witches who ruled over one of the lands because Oz was split into four lands, the Munchkins, the Quadlings, and the two others. Gillikins, I forget what the other one. But, you know, each has a color, and everything in that land is that color. Again, the colors, the vibes, the Green Lantern color rings. Each, each land had a particular vibe. And uh, the witches each ruled one in the east and the west. Glinda ruled one in the north. And I, th I don't even know who the good witch of the south was, but, you know, uh, no, they were the witches because they dominated over the lands as kind of rulers. Mombi wasn't even that. Mombi was just some, some person who, you know, dabbled in magic. And this happens in Oz. The person who made the powder of life was also one of these people. And boy, the process of making the powder of life, it is the story of artificial intelligence. It's the story of machine learning, by the way. L. Frank Baum intuited machine learning and artificial intelligence, and it takes the form of the powder of life, and the process it takes to make the powder of life is so fascinating and deep, deep channeling of, you know, how hard actually accomplishing, you know, uh, sentience in machines really is. But he's not the first. The wizard who makes the, uh, the magician, they call him a magician, the magician who makes the powder of life isn't the only one that makes that stuff. There's yet another machine man. The Tin Woodman isn't really a machine man. He's a human being who got turned into a metal man. There is a real man of metal whose name is TikTok. TikTok, TikTok, the original TikTok is an actual robot, a machine sentient intelligent robot. And he comes into the story pretty early on during one of Dorothy's returns to Oz. I don't think it's, yeah, I think it's in her first return to Oz. It's when she returns to Oz for the first time from a storm on the ocean, taking a cruise with Uncle Henry to visit a relative in Australia. In Australia, right? It, it, there's an Australia tie-in with the Wizard of Oz. Uh, Uncle Henry has relatives in Australia. And in taking a long uh, trip, boat ride, uh, to uh, visit that relative, uh, a storm sets in and wrecks the boat and Dorothy is floating on the floatsome or whatever and uh, teams up with a chicken who she thought was Bill but turns out to be Billina. So pronouns and names and gender. And um, lands on the land of Ev, not quite Oz. It's not the return to Oz right away. She has to have an adventure in the land of Ev first. And in Ev, she meets up with TikTok, who is wound down, but was made by a very uh, mechanical inventor type company. 
who could do amazing things unlike anyone else. And so TikTok is kind of like one of a kind, like a data, just like Isaac Asimov intuited a Lieutenant Data-like character in his robot series. Not the compilation of the short stories, but the, you know, the serial, uh, iRobot serial books uh, is where the Lieutenant Data character first appeared. And, um, TikTok is another one of those characters. I think that's where I'll wrap it up. I got so much. I could just go on forever, but uh, it's time to shift my mindset. Transition. Transition as if one goes into reading a book and, uh, coming out of reading a book. Being able to transition like that on demand from reading for pleasure very important, people. Very important. Read for pleasure. And you can't tell someone to do that. They just have to take it up on their own. So entice people to read for pleasure. Lead by example. Lead by example.